Thank you all for coming. This is my second trip to the university. I heard I'm going to get a couple of credit hours this semester. <laughs> today, it's my second trip today. Um, Terry? Where's Terry? I'm um, right here. Would you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Mickey Barter? I'm here. Ray DeCosimo? Here. Serena Desai? Here. Carol Hoffman? Here. Scott Leroy? Here. Juwan Lewis? Here. Gretchen Potts? Here. Uh, I've already got this out of order. I was supposed to have the roll call before I welcomed everybody. Terry, there's some people you just can't help. Uh, <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn it over to the <coughs> Chancellor for his remarks. So thank you for being here. We appreciate all your time and uh, preparation. I know we sent you a bunch of stuff uh, beforehand. Um, you know, a little over a week ago, we had uh, our commencement ceremony, which that's why we're here. It was great. Um, Juwan Lewis graduated, yes. and we got him down the street. <laughs> His mother graduated from Chad State the same morning, and so giving him giving his uh, SGA president remarks and then to run down the street so he could graduate. I think he was able to see his mother graduate and then uh, be a part of our ceremonies too. And uh, we appreciate all you've done as SGA president and being the inaugural student member of this board. So, um, thank you. Um, we have... Uh, Benjamin Smith, who's here today, um, who is going to be the next um, student representative. And uh, so he's going to get the lowdown and figure out um, the, the system. And, uh, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly? And, yeah. Um, hey, everybody. Um, my name's uh, Ben. Um, I'm really looking forward to serving on this board. Um, I'm an upcoming senior. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. Um, if you guys want to reach out to me or need my phone number or any sort of information, um, feel free to reach out to me. But I'm really looking forward to the opportunity. Okay. And you, you have his resume um, and his contact information there. Now, he's a, a physics major, biophysics, uh, mathematics minor, a Brock scholar. Um, involved in uh, fraternity life, I think, as uh, chapter president um, this last year. Um, so he's been a very engaged student, and um, we look forward to what you'll bring to the board. So, okay. Ben, just adding, the, being the inaugural student representative, got you on three offers. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is incredible. That is some probably had to do with <coughs> Juwan's accomplishments at <laughs> the university. Juwan, thank you. Um, the minutes were mailed to everyone, and also in your folder, you had an opportunity to look at them. And I have a motion to accept them. Okay. It's mailed. I'll, I'll move approval. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's great. Thank you. Any discussion? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, thank you. Uh, motion carries. Uh, we have some proposed bylaw recommendations. Recommendations, Yusuf. Sure you are. <coughs> you want to? I believe you were all forwarded a summary of the four changes that are being proposed. I just wanted to do that very quickly. Um, section 4.2, there's a change made to the conflicts of interest uh, provision to allow the faculty board member to pursue externally granted funds and contracts and wouldn't run afoul of that, that provision. That was a change that was made by UTK UTM's um, board uh, bylaws. We also uh, modified or proposing to modify section 7.4 to require seven days notice for regular meetings. That just is in alignment with our current practice. And similarly, for 7.6, 7 we uh, are going to try to provide all the reports and resolutions to the board members seven days in advance when feasible. Obviously, there may not be the opportunity to do so, do so before seven days, but we'll certainly try to do that every time. And then finally, for just a correction of a typo, going to section eight. Any questions? 
Thank you. May I have a motion to accept the bylaws? Corrected. Karen, you got a second one over here? Who did Scott that? Who made the motion? Who made the motion? Judge Barker. Judge Barker. I guess you can't really say that. <laughs> uh, we'll need a roll call vote on this. Nikki Barker? Yeah, aye. Brady Cosina? Aye. Serena Desai? Aye. Carol Hoffman? Aye. Scott Lewis? Aye. Juwan Lewis? Aye. Gretchen Potts? Aye. Um, now here is one of the main, if not the main reason that the, the um, advisory committee was created and um, <coughs> to uh, approve the budget for the university. And I'm going to ask Vice Chancellor Brown if he will give us a report since he did all the heavy lifting on it. Chairman, well, thank you and members of the advisory committee, thank you for being here today. Uh, by way of introduction, let me introduce some key members of my team too, Tyler Forrest and Chris Service, and another young lady named Allison Evans. I, Allison's not here with us today, but three key members of, of the uh, budget and finance team here at the university. Also want to start by thanking Chancellor Engel for his leadership in this budget planning process. In order to uh, get to a budget uh, position where we are today, it takes a lot of planning, months of planning, and he has been a good steward of that process. So thank you, Chancellor Engel. This is the last budget for George Hine, who's the provost here. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hine and I actually co-chaired the actual budget process for the university, uh, the chief academic officer. And I want to thank him, too, for his leadership in getting us to this point. Uh, I'm going to go over the abbreviated budget for you today. You have been sent a full budget <coughs> copy with a, with a lot of schedules behind it. So I'm going to kind of go over the abbreviated version. If you have questions, you can stop me at any time. You know, budgets really do reflect the fiscal health of the institution. They also reflect the priorities of the institution. Where you budget your money is generally where your priorities are in terms of those investments. Our process is critical that we have full participation, Mr. Chair, across the university. So again, we began this process in September of last year, and we're right before we are today. So I want to kind of stand and move through this whole operating budget process. The goals of our process, of course, is to align our priorities and budget with the strategic plan of the institution, our strategic goals, making sure that everyone across the institution understands the budget, the full budget, which means you must have transparency of process. That means we've had lots of meetings and lots of conversations about this, including the chance of holding an open town hall meeting, going through the budget a line item at a time so people can have input. We also post all of our documents online. And we have a chat site, so you can actually send us things that you like and things that you don't like. And even if you don't like them, we respond back to you on those too. Uh, again, broad inclusion, working uh, carefully. We've got an internal budget advisory committee and what we call a new PRAC, a, a broader university planning committee, which includes all shared governance representatives across <coughs> the university. So if our crediting agency came in and kind of pulled uh, Yancey aside and said, what's in your budget? I hope he'll pass the test, because he's certainly been, been, been tuned up to what's in the budget. These are our four strategic plan goals of the institution. Every investment must align with one of those goals. We call allocation investments, and we are looking for return on those investments. So uh, at the beginning of the next budget cycle, we will ask department heads and chance, vice chancellors, what do we get for our investment? What's the return on investment? Did we accomplish what we intended? So we ask those really tough questions. Our timeline again, we started back in uh, really in September, uh, leading up to the day, May the 14th here. And our next phase, if you approve this budget going forward, it will go to, uh, to the CFO of the UT system and to the president of the system to be presented to the UT Board of Trustees for a full uh, vote there. And that's in June the 21st of this year. Well, let's take a look at our budget here, what we're proposing going forward with today. A total 2020 budget, $204 million of revenues, $204,064,391. dollars 
when we look at where that money comes from, what is that revenue originally, tuition and fees will drive 58% of the budget going forward. Some $118.4 million comes from tuition and fees. We'll talk a little bit about the history of that. State appropriation, I talked to Judge Barker a little bit about that, comes in at about 29%. $59,484,000 in, in state appropriation. We always whine across the state about state appropriation support, but believe it or not, Tennessee is very good in terms of the amounts that they are really funding public higher education. Bear in mind, there is no state statute that requires state legislature to fund public higher education. Every dollar we get there is a discretionary dollar, which means that we've got to make sure that our value proposition is very clear to the state. How does this university add value to the state? But we're glad to get this 29%. I'd love more, <laughs> but we're not gonna turn that away. Uh, another 10% comes in auxiliary services, everything from book sales to food service operations. Uh, Again, sales and contracts, another 3% at 4.8 million, and state some grants and contracts at about 453,000, rounding out this $204 million revenue budget. Well, how do we propose spending that money? How will we expense it out uh, by category? Well, again, budgets reflect your priority. We will spend appropriately almost 83.3 million of that money in instruction. Our core at this university is undergraduate and graduate level teaching and research and public service. So you will see over 50% of this budget allocated or invested in the academic enterprise here. 39% in instruction, another 2%, 3.5 million in research, public service, 2.7 million, academic support, these are all the support systems that the provost has in place, another 17.4 million. Student services, and again, this taxonomy has athletics in it. So every time Yancey sees that, he thinks, oh, that's his money. It is not. At the end of the day, we appropriate part of that uh, university athletics. But another 13% at 27.3 million there. Institutional support uh, at 8%, that's appropriate. This is in line with Nakubo standards, about $17 million. Uh, the physical plant, which is very, very important, 10% at 21 million. I say that's important because when, when uh, parents and students first visit a university, 70% of the time their decision to attend is based on how the place looks and feels. Really, really important to have an attractive, well-operated campus. And you can see we're doing a lot on this campus in terms of making it pretty here and functional, very functional here. Uh, scholarships about 14 million, 7%, and this is a number we'll talk a little bit more about. That number always moves because we try to stay competitive with scholarships. Uh, judge, it also lowers the cost of attendance for students. And auxiliaries, again, about 10%, about 20 million, total again of uh, 204 million, 64,000 as we expense that budget out. Taking a different kind of look at it, uh, what do we spend on people? Again, about 70% about of our operation is what we call human capital driven. We accomplish this work through talented faculty and staff who help us get the job done. So appropriately, you will see about $94 million of this budget, 94.5, 46% will be invested in salaries across the institution. Another 35 million benefit costs. And that's one of the good things about the University of Tennessee. It has an excellent benefits program uh, that, that attracts, that helps us stay competitive in attracting faculty and staff to the institution. And again, operating budgets, 35% at another $70 million. Over the last five years, we've begun to, to move the needle on operating dollars. These are support dollars that, that, that departments need to, to keep things moving. Again, $204 million. Uh, human capital driven, uh, a lot of people. I just looked at the numbers of, of faculty, staff, and administrators here. Uh, my 2018 numbers looks like we're at about uh, 1,400 uh, faculty and staff members for the campus. So we're one of the larger employers in Hamilton County. This university is very, very important uh, to the fiscal health of this entire county. 
We also get some restricted money that comes in uh, uh, that adds to this budget, about $52.5 million uh, that comes in. Grants and contracts, about $44.4 million of those restricted dollars comes in grants and contracts, about 85% of that pie. Other sources, about $7 million comes in at about 14%. These are grants and other types of contracts that come in to the budget. And we even get about almost 800000 in specialized state appropriation that we use for diversity and inclusion funds. When the guy consent decree was settled uh, about 10 years ago, they allocated special funds for all public universities to ensure we diversify our universities. So every campus gets a, gets a portion of those funds. The way we expense that, those special uh, funds out, those restricted funds out, you might guess 79% comes in the form of scholarships again, right? We're very, very fortunate on this campus to have gifts of scholarships. Many of these are dedicated scholarships. Again, all of these lower the cost of attendance for our students. Scholarship support. Student support services at about 2%. Uh, academic support at about 4%, 2.1 million. And public service at about 1.2 million. Research, again, very, very important for us, uh, $3 million there, and of course, some money going back to instruction again at about $3.5 million. Sure. Sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I learned this yesterday, and I think the board should know this, that 79% in scholarships includes the HOPE scholarships. Yes. Also, that FW stands for fee waivers. No. So when the state <laughs> says that we'll allow someone get a discount to come to UTC, we have to cover the cost. The state does not cover the cost. Yeah, I didn't have to even say that. I'm No, I learned it yesterday. So <laughs> <laughs> Tyler's presentation yesterday, he spoke about that, and I was really surprised. I guess you could yeah. say they're covering it because they're giving us 29% of our budget, but... Nothing is specific to cover that. We call it an unfunded mandate. You aggregate that up, it costs a lot of money every year, you know, that uh, anytime you say, well, we're gonna give uh, a discount to uh, veterans, and then we'll give a discount to, to the family members and teachers, firemen, every year it's another group. And it also comes with an, un sometimes it's not funded at all. The institution has to step up and fund that. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, that's a good interruption. <laughs> We have several fee changes in this budget, and I want to kind of go through those with you. Some of these fees are done at the UT board level. Some of them the system president can approve, and then the chancellor here can approve some of these locally. Just want to quickly go through some of those so you understand what these are all about. Uh, residential housing, every year, uh, you know, housing goes up just a little bit. It's only 2% this year, generates about $371,000. These funds are normally utilized for repairs and maintenance. Oftentimes you have walls burst. You, you've managed some property, you understand that very well at the end of the day, but it is to keep the housing fresh and to be able to make sure it stays competitive. Uh, dining and meal plans, this is within our Aramark contract. This is a mandatory increase embedded in that contract at 2.5%. I do want to say a little something about meal plans though. Several years ago, the chancellor asked that we eliminate meal plans for juniors and seniors. And we had to go and negotiate that through Aramark. Tyler did a great job of that, helping with that. And Aramark said yes to that. What that did though, it made our housing far more competitive at the end of the day because juniors and seniors had a choice right, that, that they didn't have to buy into these meal plans. Believe it or not, they didn't lose any money by it. They just enhanced their quality. <coughs> the students bought them anyway. Quality does drive. Uh, it, it's a good indicator there. So I just wanted to make that note to you. The athletic fee, uh, about 10 years ago, the Tennessee Higher Education Commission said to four-year universities, you really need to rethink your funding model for athletics for mid-major programs. We're not like that big orange country up the road. I won't say the name of it. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Who really make a lot of money at, at athletics. Uh, they're, they're an auxiliary service. Here you have to fund athletics a little bit differently. They instructed us to look at a student athletic fee model. This is generally how you do it in mid-major programs. You'll find most of our competitive universities have an athletic fee. We have one too, it's currently at $480. We're recommending a $34, very incremental small increase to that athletic fee. That will be only two increases of fees that you'll see. 
did the athletic fee pay for the uh, the uh, slip and slide and all that? The, the student activities, student activities yeah. pay for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I heard it's a separate budget. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah. It, 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 was the athletic fee that was that? Did that not pay for it? No, a separate no. line. It was a separate. Okay. It's different. Yeah. Yancey gets the bill for it, but he, it's a different budget. Okay. Yeah. So it generates at $34, generates about $343,000 for athletics, and that covers all kinds of cost increases to make our programs competitive. Also for Title IX, when we're trying to, there's Stephanie, the Title IX coordinator sitting there, we're trying to make sure that we've got adequate funding for all sports, men and women. And you're gonna see us stand up a sand volleyball division one competition for women. So we need additional dollars to make that happen. You're also going to see a $10 fee increase for the technology fee. Again, we've not increased these fees in seven to 10 years. So we've really held the line on that. Uh, we're really proud of that. But this 10%, uh, I mean, this uh, $10 increase generates about $123,000 really for uh, system upgrades at the end of the day, technology upgrades across the institution. Uh, we have to be very vigilant on IT security and those kinds of systems. These funds will be invested for those purposes. Uh, this is a board approved uh, fee, a differential uh, tuition fee, a nursing differential fee. The current fee sets at $57. We're proposing a $43 increase, raising that to $100. We benchmarked our fee against our peers. We were very, very low, extremely low. Even by moving to this amount, we remain competitive. We're not the highest. What nursing will tell you, they'll use this $250,000 for technology, instruction, equipment to deliver uh, that, that particular program. I always tell the story. They've got things down there that talk back to you. They've got these simulation mannequins. I think the first time I went to see one, I got an invoice. It was like $80,000. I said, and it said mannequin. I said, I'm not paying $8,000 for a mannequin. What, what is that? So I called the director of nursing. I said, Dr. Brown, come down here. I'll show you what that is. So I walk in, and there's this mannequin laying there, and it's talking to me. And it sounds just like I do when I'm sick. Oh, that really hurts. You can do all kinds of things with, with these mannequins. So they're really uh, computers at the end of the day. That's the kind of technology they're using in this particular program. We've got some lab fees that will be recommended for the UT president uh, at uh, 17,400, small changes there. And of course, parking decals, 2.5% generates about $23,000. This is for maintenance of our parking lots. Uh, they're not much, but we really do need that. And this is a chancellor approved, both of these are chancellor approved fees. Uh, the physician's assistant seat fee. This is the system is a new program we're standing up. And what this is, is like a preliminary deposit that ensures you are coming. Because the program is so competitive that if you get accepted, we want to make sure you're coming. So we feel like if you put down $500, you got a little skin in the game, we can assure that you're coming. We actually add that back <laughs> to your tuition so you don't lose that. It just guarantees that you're going to come. We think that that's smart. This is an industry standard. Richard, yes. that for a master's degree program? Which one? It's a master's. It's yes. a master's, okay. It's in the accreditation process and should start January of 21. Yeah, I had a phone call about that. With your differentials, uh, I know you're probably going to get to this section later on, but there were just some tuition increases, College of Business and so forth. How were those determined? By the, by the colleges themselves. They actually do the benchmarking and determine what the, what's appropriate based on their peer benchmark. Gotcha. Yeah. And we also look at what's going on around the UT system too, making sure we're not out of line. And That's you ended up paying for that $80,000 van, didn't you? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, you did. I really did. I was <laughs> glad to do it. We appreciate that. <laughs> I just wanted to give you a full comparison of mandatory fees. When we talk about tuition and fees, there's this fee amount that you need to be aware of that makes up the total tuition uh, in terms of full disclosure. These are all the fees that we currently charge here across the university. Uh, you, act, you ask about the slip and slide, right? 
That's it in the student activity fee. That's what that's that's what pays for that that play pen down there. Uh, and students, by the way, love that place. It's full, Yancey, from what time in the morning? 5 a.m. to midnight. Yes. It's a really good thing. Uh, also, debt service fees pay a portion of those things, too, and actually pay for some of the expansion here at the University Center. Those are the kinds of fees we have there. Health services fee, $120. That fee pays for health services for our students. They get sick, get an earache. That they go get visits at the student health center. Also, psychiatric services are part of that too. And we're finding that that's a huge trend in public higher education, the need for additional counseling and psychiatric services. We're glad to provide that. Athletics, we talked a little bit about that. 480, we're only asking for $34 again for an additional. That fee will go to 514. We've got a green fee on campus. When you look around campus, you see a beautifully green campus. We planted over 1,000 trees on this campus in the last 15 years. My grounds crew probably won't hug me for that. They're the ones that have to build all the leaves. <laughs> but it is a beautiful, beautiful, sustainable campus. Some of that green fee pays for that. There's technology again, the $10 that we're going up there. The library also has a fee of $50 that adds uh, support for our library, making sure that, that journals stay fresh. Uh, there in the library. Then there's a transportation fee that was incorporated to help pay for the parking decks that you see across the campus. All students pay that. Parking's a big deal on an urban campus and there's never enough of it. Facilities fee as well, an international fee we implemented a couple of years ago because we're making the university more global and we're reaching out uh, across the globe to attract students. So you see, uh, currently $1,776 will move uh, $44 to 1820 This will keep us also in, in alignment with our tuition ask. You'll see this at 2.5%. At, at so let's talk a little bit about new revenue and what we're, what we're looking towards. How do we get this new revenue to the table? We're respectfully asking for a 2.5% increase in tuition. No out-of-state increase will generate about $1,942,000 for us. This is well within what TDAC, the Higher Education Commission, has recommended for all public universities. I would like to add that last year, we got zero for a tuition increase. I know I'm being recorded, so I better be careful I talk about that. But would I have loved to have had some tuition increase? The answer is yes. Yes. We were not allowed to have any increase at all. We did a lot of our budget on reserve funds, non-recurring funds. But we think this is very reasonable. We are very sensitive to the cost of attendance. And when you're going to see our net cost of attendance is very, very low. We sent that to you in the packet. When we add back in scholarships, grant and aid, and other forms of, of aid that we give, we are a very competitive, good priced university, right? We're reallocating some internal funds. We discontinued the professional MBA program and that these were revenues that were coming into that. So we put that back in the budget for internal reallocation in that program. Dean Dooley is doing something different with the MBA program. We're implementing a new 15 and four tuition completion model. Uh, you've heard some about that before. This is trying to make sure students graduate in four years. It generates about $2.2 million. The bulk of that money will be spent on instruction, almost a mid well, in excess of a million dollars, on instruction, making sure that we have faculty on the ground to ensure that the courses are there, what we call roadblock courses, are removed so a student can get that section of English or math or biology, they don't have to wait an additional semester or year. This is very, very important that we, that we add those funds. We're the third campus to implement this. We're kind of late to the game on this one. Martin already has implemented one and Knoxville has already implemented that. So we're excited about uh, the 15 and four model. Differential tuition, again, there's the nursing piece at 353,000. <clears throat> Here's something we're really, really proud of, CCTA, the Outcome-Based Performance Model. For four years in a row, UTC led all public universities in the state in terms of uh, performance metrics. 
We're it. Everybody else is trying to figure out what's in our Kool-Aid. How do we do that every year? Much of it is driven by the, the graduation of baccalaureate degree holding students in the state. That's one of our key metrics. And then how we complete those students in 30, 60, and 90 hour increments, money flows at that. So we've been very, very well at that. The good news is that Governor Haslam was very good to public higher education during his tenure as governor. Governor Lee is following <laughs> the same line. They are fully funding the state funding formula for public higher education. That's a big deal. Bear in mind that this stacks up against prisons and 10 care and K through 12 schools. You have about five things ahead of public higher education. So when it gets to us, sometimes the money's not there. It has to be a priority. And this Governor Lee has made it a priority. He fully funded it this year and Governor Haslam did. So we're, we're very thankful for that. And we're thankful for the legislature who actually appropriates the money. I always like to say that the governor recommends that it's the legislature that signs off on it and makes it happen. We will pick up $2.8 million from CCTI outcome growth. You see a bit of a deduction there of a rebalancing of 401,000. We've got a main building offline that we're getting ready to renovate, the old library here on campus. When you take a building offline, they deduct that. They will not give you operating dollars for that building. I argued for that. I said, I still got lights on. I cut the grass around it. No, Richard, we're not going to give you any money for it. So that's what that deduct is. But again, we are still probably, even with that, probably number three in the state. I mean, we're still at the top of the level in terms of CCTA. And my hat's off to the faculty and the provost and others, for, and, and guys like Yancey, for making that happen uh, with students. Fees, athletic and technology and seat fee will generate $467,000. And here's a big deal, enrollment growth. From fall of 18 to spring of 19, we get an opportunity because of FTE growth to put a half a million dollars of recurring revenue back into the budget. So enrollment does matter. <clears throat> I'm looking at Yancey. Enrollment does matter. At the end of the day, I was sitting at commencement. The chancellor was shaking a lot of hands. The president was there shaking a lot of hands. I'm the only guy with a clicker on this road. <laughs> when we get up to about 500 of them, I'm saying to Yancey, you got to get 500 more back in. It's a big deal. So enrollment really does drive a lot of what we do here. And of course, you're going to see us put in about $3.6 million of what we call non-recurring investments one-time funds that are very project specific kinds of funds but actually get you to the next budget cycle. So you'll see us propose new revenue of $12 million for this campus total. I want you to know that we went through a process where we had to cut that in half. Our process generated over 20 some odd million dollars worth of requests. If we could have gotten the revenue, I would have funded all of them. I recommended all of them to be funded. All of them were good. Every dean had good programs. Just the reality is that we cannot get recurring revenue to the table. Here's another look at how we look at this budget in terms of uses of, 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 of where the revenue actually comes from. This eight million in the blue is recurring revenue. With recurring revenue, you can do certain things with. You can hire people with recurring revenue. Yeah, right? Reserves, you go back and deal with uh, one-time things like we're going to put some money for utilities out of the reserve budget. When we're trying to benchmark and trying to figure out what utilities are going to really look like when we take on new property. Those are some of the things that we, we deal with that. Am I going too fast? Let me see the hands. Am I all right? Okay, all right. Taking a look at new expenses here is a, a real good snapshot. You've got a good schedule in your report that has line items on it, okay? I sent that to you in advance. Very quickly though, here's a proposed new investment, new expenses, what we're looking at from recurring revenue from our 15 and 4 completion dollars and non-recurring revenues by division. The chancellor did not ask for any money this year. Pretty good stuff at the end of the day, right? Academic Affairs, again, asked for, for uh, a several uh, budget allocations or investments. They will pick up $3.9 million, new dollars, in this budget. This is very healthy for the academic side of the house. I see, and the provost did a really good job of getting us to that number. It was much bigger. <laughs> yes, 
but this funds the priorities for that division. I can say that every major division across the university was touched with their top projects, with their top projects. Research in the graduate school, $94,000 of recurring, uh, non-recurring, 86,000, total 181,000. The vision I manage, administration and finance, uh, 311,000 of recurring, 288 of non-recurring, $599,000 for administration and finance. Enrollment management, 211,000 of recurring, 25,000 of 15 and four dollars, as well as 84, a total of uh, 100, I'm sorry, 84,220 total for, for that division. 540,000 for the enrollment management division. Student affairs, I'm sorry, is 84,000. Both of these divisions now report to Dr. Freeman uh, uh, combined. Communications and marketing, 43,000 recurring and total 43,005 dollars. IT, information technology, recurring, 275,730. Non-recurring, 360,635,730 total. I want to talk a little bit about IT as we rebalance and rethink IT on our campus. We had one systems engineer on this campus. This is the person that manages everything. If that person goes out and get hit by a truck, we're in trouble. So we figured out we better get some bench strength they are very quickly. So you'll see in that budget us trying to take a look at succession planning and having bench strength in a very key piece of the university there. Institutional support uh, right here, 2.1 million there, a uh, 2.1 million of non-recurring as well, 4,153. About 2 million of that is compensation. It's a 2% salary pool that the governor has recommended for all of state employees. And of course, scholarships and fee waivers, something that we pay a lot of attention to, 573,000 of recurring revenue, 440,000 of 15 and four dollars, which, uh, which we'll add to scholarships. And again, some non-recurring money of 400,000, $1.4 million of investment there, again, lowering the cost of attendance. We do a lot of scholarships. It also enhances the quality of the students that attend this university. So again, totaling out on the, on the expense side, you saw 12 million on the revenue side. That's how we spend that $12 million. We did that very transparently, very openly, a lot of gnashing of teeth. We came back to the table and everyone agreed that they, these were the top priorities for the institution. Just kind of give you another look, a, a visual look, a bar look at, at the same proposed expenditures. <coughs> you take a look at the academic affairs column way up because that's again, that's the core of what we do here at the institution. It is about instruction and research uh, and, and public service there on the academic side of the house. You see the other, the institutional again, much of that's compensation that's spread across all the units, that 2%. And again, notion that scholarships, those are top priorities across this university. Let's take a look at tuition. So, so you know, as an advisory board, kind of where are we in the state in terms of our peer set with tuition, with, with, with universities around the state of Tennessee, starting with Tennessee State, going all the way down to UT Knoxville. Our current, right now, with our total mandatory fees and undergraduate maintenance fees, UTC sets at about $8,664. If you'll notice that UT Martin is even higher than we are right now. And so there's some electricity in this for us at the end of the day. Generally, for, for many years, we've always been ahead of Martin because we're a different kind of campus. We're very, much more complex and larger. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. well, so less better. than 60 credit hours is going away because that was before they did their 15-4, they call it Soren 4, so are we going to. But um, that, the UT Martin is the third from the bottom, which is greater than 60 credit hours. That's what they're charging right now is 94, 98. And that other one, uh, um, 88, 62 will go away. At, it went away. It's the end of this year, or so. Um, 
So they are, when you look at where we are and they are, it's um, a substantial amount. Yes. Any question about that? Just a comment. Okay. If it, Richard, it looks like we're, we got a better product for less. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. But I don't want to be too much less at being the thing. So it does take revenue to, to kind of deliver quality. That's kind of what we're what we're going right. for. Again, another look at undergraduate tuition and fees. I want you to look at the out-of-state number right now, twenty-four thousand four seventy-four. Look at it in comparison with the in-state fees. What you will find in this industry is all the states around you now are doing tuition discounting on out of state. That's how they're getting a competitive edge. So you're gonna see us recommend to the UT board, and we'll give that to you today, we're gonna to recommend a reduction of 50% on our out of state tuition to make sure for folks bordering states. I wanna say that because this has this costs us a little money. We're looking at states that touch us. Plus yeah. South Carolina. Plus South Carolina, plus one. Bordering states plus South Carolina. And the graduate school, if you'll notice, back in 2019, we actually went to the board and had, had them reduce out of state for graduate. Trying to find the sweet spot, what will make us far more competitive in terms of recruiting students there. Richard, what was the result of that in terms of number of graduate school students from out of state? You, you know, we're in the process now of trying to recruit more. We had to add a recruiter. Okay. You've got to hit the ground, Mr. Chairman, and, and run with this. Right. Sure you're okay, just started this. So this fiscal year was the first year right. you did that. Okay. We have not hit That's the right. break even yet. We know it's about, what, 120 something on, 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 on new students, and we're pushing them to get there. You say break even. I mean, the incremental cost of adding an out of state student is what? Zero? It, it, the, the revenue it's that the, we, that it's we the lost. Yeah, it's, it, we look at revenue loss because yeah. we're already getting that revenue in. If we don't get that amount of revenue, we have to right. add more students to make the yeah, but I think the case. Yeah. It is zero. Take the middle cost. Yeah, I, 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 I know where you're going <laughs> coming from. But you need volume. Yeah, that's right. Right. Curiosity. Yeah. We have eight states before us. Most of the nation except Missouri, but and I'm all for it. But in South Carolina, there's some special. We got a lot of students from South Carolina. We, we actually get a lot of kids coming out there. Yancey, at the end of the day, Yancey does yeah, recruiting. Do, uh, believe it or not, the proximity of, of South Carolina versus um, you know states that are further yeah. north. Or, I'm out of inside this yeah. water. And, and so that we could make it cleaner as well through the proposal for this regional rate, we included South Carolina. We, we didn't want to shame them away out of an opportunity to enjoy UTC. So we've included South Carolina as part of this as well, you know, within this region, the Southeast region. When you do that, do, do you go to, do we go to the, do we go to the legislatures and ask for reciprocity? It's, it's, it's the board. I mean the board. Yeah, that's the UT that's, board has to decide on this rule. Yes. It used to be that the state legislature frowned on that when they were doing seventy percent. They would say that you're taking yeah. Tennessee money and paying <coughs> Georgia students. But now that that's been almost reversed, that's a non-argument now. It's a non-issue. Yeah. There, there are several schools right now. Dr. Brown is absolutely correct. There are several institutions within this region that are offering in-state tuition to our students to come to the, I mean, Valdosta State is one uh, in South Georgia that is offering in-state to any Hamilton County student to go there, and it's in South Georgia. So it is becoming very, very competitive, and I'm concerned that if we don't do something, we will uh, not be able to keep up with, you know, recruiting uh, really good out-of-state students to come to us. I think Dalton State does as well. They do, uh, yes, they not, do. Not only for, uh, us, but for Chattanooga State students as well, so they're very competitive. Arkansas State, you know, it, there are several of them around, so. Is it being offered as uh, just an all-around discount for all students that are applying from out of state? I, I Just curious because my son, um, who was going to attend the University of South Carolina, it's more of a scholarship that he, that he was offered that he became an in-state student, uh, tuition like an in-state student. Some of them will offer scholarship programs to offset the cost of, of the out-of-state amount. 
um, this would in fact be a reduction in the cost of, of out-of-state yes. tuition for those students. And so there's no requirement for the university to come back and fill those with scholarship funds, uh, you know, for those students who are here. Uh, it will allow us more leverage to be able to you know, get <laughs> students to come to us. Our goal is to uh, go after those students that sort of meet our profile, the ones that are, our profile right now is around a 35, a 24 ACT score. Our goal is to go after those students that meet the profile that can continue to increase that profile for us overall. Uh, but this would be a reduction, you know, in that out-of-state amount. We may still offer scholarship funds to those students to continue to entice them, but this proposal is a reduction of the out-of-state. It would save us money yes. for uh, programs like athletics for a student coming from Georgia. Honor students are classified as in-state. If you come into our Brock Scholars or into our Honors College, you automatically pay the in-state rate we scholarship a lot of those, so it saves us money. But we cannot waive tuition. Um, <laughs> it's just not allowed. So it's an obligation that we have to provide scholarship money. And um, in, in some respects, it's funny money. You know you're not going to get it because you're going to give them a scholarship, so why not just zero it out? Well, I tried for two years working with our budget people. <laughs> And it, the um, system, UT system, said, mean, no, you cannot do this. It is not allowed. Um, and other public universities in the state of Tennessee that say they're doing this are actually coming back and providing scholarship money, even though the presidents of those campuses think they're allowed to do a waiver. Um, and we've, we've spent a lot of time, they, um, Tyler and, and Chris and Richard, looking at this. So. Um, this would allow us to be competitive. We still need to bring in, I think, 140 yeah. students because the revenue, we do have some full out-of-state fee-paying students now. To have the same revenue, we need to bring in a few more people. Yeah. If we went nationwide, it's yeah. another couple hundred students, which was just a little bit too much. So that's why yeah. we went with the neighboring states and added in South Carolina, where there's really competitive recruiting opportunities for us and um, with the hope to expand this broader. President Boyd would have preferred us to do um, one rate nationwide in-state plus 4,000 is what he suggested because neighboring counties, if you're in a county um, neighboring in uh, Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, it's in-state plus $4,000. So, um, and that's been really a, a good thing. We've expanded very, very that yeah. to four years. Um, we've added volume, you know, we've added students to programs. In, in those areas, we're more selective. We set a higher bar for more <coughs> students to succeed. So in all of these out of state, we're not looking to bring in students that are gonna cause more work, but help us set the bar right that add to diversity, that fill out majors where we have capacity. And the risk, the financial risk, if we did it nationwide, over well, $6 million yeah. for the base budget. So we're incrementally trying to do this and <coughs> finding the sweet spot. And hopefully that advisory boards like yourself will kind of keep a note when you touch legislators to say, you know, they ought to be able to discount tuition. Because I think like that's a big delegation deal. Is particularly opposed to it. Am I correct? I understand this correctly. But at this point, we're asking the same tuition for out-of-state students in those particular states plus South Carolina. Other universities in Tennessee may be doing something similar, but they're calling it scholarships. Is that right? That's right, but we're asking for in-state plus $8,000. Right. Okay. Okay. And so the they're, they're going to pay more than their share to come here basically double. Instead of three times the in-state rate, they're going to play two times the in-state rate. And we think we can recruit students and be successful with that. My only thought is probably off the wall is that we <coughs> to approve this, but ultimately the legislature decides how much money to appropriate. If something we've got in, we're, we're, we're giving these out-of-state students a cut, they may want to cut her. But I mean, I'm just thinking the worst case scenario. Well, and some of that depends how we're um, <coughs> Where's the money coming from for the scholarships? And a lot of that is gift 
money. You know, the Brock Endowment pays for Brock students, that's the in-state portion. Um, and we have a number of scholarships through the UC Foundation that, that can be used. Okay, so I'm all for it. I'm just so, yeah. thinking about that, that crazy legislator that comes along. Well, I would even say, Judge Barker, that, that the other piece to that, too, I know that, uh, that some legislators have been concerned about capacity and our ability to take on additional students. And yeah. uh, as far as I know, we're in a growth mode. And, and so for us, it's a rolling admission status. Uh, and so for those students that meet our admission requirement, you know, we are admitting and, and uh, making offers to those students. And so we have not, uh, to this point, you know, denied admission to an in-state resident over an out-of-state resident. There was no preference for an out-of-state person for an in-state person. And so it does address some of the concerns. That That's really important, yeah. 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 especially with this admission scandal yeah. yes. going mm -hmm. on. I mean, that's what I saw it as, is we're basically selling <coughs> assets that's Absolutely. not being utilized by our state students. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Opportunity and, cost. And, and you know, the capacity is there. It's not you know, cost uh, in terms of hard cost. Uh, and so you're collecting, you know, uh, let's say talent. Right. Well, you know, to fill that capacity that's not being used by our state students. Yeah. If the state students start stepping up and filling the programs, then you know, it's a good problem to have, and yeah. we'll revisit it then. Part of this is also the difficulty of, uh, that UT Promise has caused in some ways, because we have free community college options that are there, and there is not a, yeah. a equivalent sort of program for the four-year schools. And so, in essence, you know, we've, they've taken some of the students who yes. would have naturally gone to the four-year institution to the community colleges and so it has uh, in some ways hurt you know enrollment overall at those four-year schools and so the opportunity to expand that base some will help us you know to maintain our enrollment and to maintain the credentials that um, you know that are there for the four-year institution <coughs> overall. so we are absolutely thinking about you know that concern that uh, legislators or even any external stakeholders might have about us denying admission to someone who is an in-state person. I think you got every argument ready. Yeah. Richard, who is going to, who pays for uh, President Boyd's initiative to eliminate tuition for those who are making? We do. We do. <laughs> I mean, there's no funding have stream. You, have you attempted to, I don't know how you factor that into a budget. It's an unknown at this point, I guess. Well, we, we, we have a preliminary number. And okay. we'll just kind of back into okay. it, fund it as we move forward. But I think it's a, I think it's a great way. it's a great opportunity. And if you're making forty nine thousand, and your job boss boss offers you a raise, I guess you just turn it down. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anybody would ever do that. Well, we'll we will work that into our financial aid funding. Program. That's why not starting that until fall of 2020 was really okay. in our mm -hmm. favor. Give us a year. Um, but you know, we had one conversation with our local state delegation, yeah. and they were very impressed about the questions that everyone asked and the engagement of the board. This would be a really good thing to have a discussion around is waiving tuition, yes. this out of state. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, I, I talked to Todd Gardenhire afterwards, and he said it was. Um, an enjoyable conversation. They'd love to do it again. Um, they want to make sure all of you were engaged, able to ask questions. They felt we were listening. So and that's one agenda item we could certainly put on that I, I think would be helpful for all of us. The good news is that when we recruit those students, uh, students in these bordering states, generally they stay in Tennessee. Uh, they'll stay in Hamilton County. So you're recruiting those folks for the workforce right here. Chattanooga is a good place to be, really a good place to be. This may be too simple of a question, but when we were talking about those programs in which we have capacity, so is it that if you're applying for a program that in-state would fill that program and then the excess of non-filled slots would then be given to these out-of-state Yeah, we, we would definitely look at our capacity at the end of the day, not denying a, t a qualified Tennessee student. I think that Dr. Freeman So they still get priority and then the spot others. 
Yes, sir. Um, are there any specific measures uh, to ensure that out of state recruitment are getting better students than we would be getting otherwise? Like, is there any measures beyond the normal qualifications for admission to UTC for these out of state students to get that decrease in tuition, or is it just a blanket, you know, policy? That's an academic profile that we're looking for. I'll let Dr. Freeman yeah, there is an academic profile that we're looking for, but this is going to be, this would in fact be a cut, you know, in mm -hmm. the out-of-state amount overall, mm -hmm. right? So it wouldn't be if you have below the uh, profile of the 35 and 24, mm -hmm. you would pay X amount. You would pay the 24,000, if mm -hmm. I, I think that was the amount that was there, versus if you had above that amount. So if there is, you know, there's not that caveat there, if I'm understanding your question. Yeah, I think he's talking about the quality of the student, the academic quality. Yeah, so if you're so not if you changing have that, different that admission that standards, is right. that basically what he's saying? I, I, I think you will see us looking for high quali highly qualified students. Yeah, that, that certainly will be the goal as we begin to sort of vet these applicants as they come in uh, and begin to look at things like the program that they want to be admitted into. Um, the uh, ACT uh, GPA credentials that are there, uh, other things like community service, leadership opportunities, the things that they've done uh, while they've been in high school. And so that vetting process, we, we think is going to take care of some of those questions about what type of student are we getting from out of state. And we track it to see, you know, uh, did we miss the mark? Are we there? Aren't we there? You know, what did we miss? And as we go into the next evolution of applicants, Thank you. Thanks for that question. Let's take a look at this slide in terms of from 2010 all the way up to 2018, uh, the number of degrees awarded here at UTC. It's a very telling slide of the growth in graduation here and the quality of students that we're graduating and putting back into the workforce, not only in Chattanooga, but in the entire state, right? You will also see there's some correlation at the bottom of the slide with the amount of revenue that you put into an institution, it costs to really produce this kind of result. That's one of the challenges that we have with Drive to 55. If you're gonna hit those benchmarks, it requires some investment in higher education to make that happen. This is a great slide for us, and this is why we've been leading the state on, in the outcome-based funding formula. And uh, they're a great slide to take a look at. Here's the one that I talked to Judge Barker about early on. He says, now Richard, you know, 20 years ago, wasn't that an inverse relationship? Did the state pay 70%? Yes. And you can see since 2001 what has happened with uh, tuition and fees. You see that blue line here, and you see state appropriations and this gap in the middle. That's the end of the day. So the revenue to fill that gap has been coming from tuition at the end of the day. We tried to keep it as low as possible over the years, never double digits. But still, that therein lies the problem. We could use much more state investment. We can, we're, we're glad to have them, talking to the camera now, we're glad to have what we're getting. Even though they won't give it back, but could we use more? Absolutely. I, I hope that kind of gives you a visual to your question. Yeah. And of course, I want to talk a little bit about human capital compensation investment. How do we keep our talent pool? How do we manage talent on the campus? People like Dr. Rowland here, Stephanie, um, faculty like Dr. Potts here. How do we manage this talent pool here? Well, you must have some type of investment, focused investment in compensation. Over the last uh, several cycles since 2013, to give you kind of a look at what we've done with compensation, we're really proud of the fact we put about $16.1 million into our total compensation plan across the campus. This includes cost of living adjustments, merit-based compensation, and market-driven assessments. So in, in that regard, uh, in market and merit, you'll see 29% at about $4.6 million. This is, this is another one that we do, faculty promotion and rollovers. For the last 10 years, in our base budget, there's a $250,000 recurring line item for faculty, any time a faculty member is promoted on this campus from assistant to associate to full professor, it comes with a 10% raise in base pay. This is on top of any other increase that's out there. So it's a nice way of keeping uh, faculty salary competitive and lowering our turnover rate for faculty. You do not want to lose this kind of talent. Right, Gretchen? 
Was that your no was that your transfer two percent in a much uh, a previous slide? There was something of budget that was transfers. It was debt. That was debt. Debt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's debt service. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Uh, the other thing is that we've added a $150,000 line item for staff this time to make sure HR can do the same thing for exempt and non-exempt staff, keeping their pay competitive as well. So we're very, very proud of that. Uh, and again, these CPI adjustments of almost $10 million, making sure that your pay stays competitive. As the, as the economy improves, other universities will come in and take talent. They will if you're not paying a competitive wage. Faculty are very mobile and staff, very, very mobile. A few budget-related items, you've got it in your packet. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with these, but I think you need to know that we're doing this because you are our advisor board. We talked a lot about that already, this out-of-state tuition reduction proposal. That's it in a nutshell <coughs> here. You'll see it requires an additional 127 out-of-state FTE students to make up for $1.8 million we'll lose if we don't uh, get 127 students from this, right? Tuition plus $8,000 is what we're looking for. So we've allocated another position there to make sure people can get out there in the marketplace and, and, and uh, recruit students. Taking a look at this out-of-state fee schedule, just showing you how competitive we'll be, uh, not only with our current position, adding a 2.5% tuition increase and our 15 and 4, we're still a very competitive university. Still very competitive. When you look, when you compare the public university price to a private in the state, I won't even mention one, you will see almost three to four times the amount of tuition that the private will charge versus what we're doing with public education in this state. And I think we're getting a great product here. A little bit of the nursing differential, we talked a little bit about that. This is what they need that for. We talked about equipment, operating, accreditation calls, faculty support, enhanced learning opportunities. And again, this keeps us competitive uh, with our peer programs. Here's one thing that we're pro proposing to the board. We did this uh, about four years ago. We're asking them to approve a voluntary retirement incentive program for the campus. We think that 136 potential retirement eligible employees will take advantage of this. 67 faculty and maybe almost 70 staff. And what that does for you, the essence of the program is simply this. What we pay you if you, and this is strictly voluntary by the way, you have to be retirement eligible. And be, to be retirement eligible means that you have to have a minimum of 20 years of service to the institution, right? We will pay you six months of your current salary in a lump sum and all of your annual leave. You'll get that check from us, right? It does so two how things. Much, how much annual leave do you accrue? Gosh. 336 hours. Yeah, it's a, good, it's, a, it's a nice amount. It's, a lot of people have probably expended oh, it though. Okay, go on. You know, it's, it varies. <laughs> you seldom pay the whole thing because many people have used portions of it. But, but at the end of the day, when we did this four years ago, we thought only 30 or 40 people would take advantage of it. Over 85 took this. What this allows you to do, it gives you the flexibility of looking at almost $11 million of salaries that you can reimagine, reinvent, and reappropriate across the institution. When that position goes out, it does not automatically go back to the division where the position came from. It goes centrally into the chancellor and the chief business officer. <laughs> and the department has to make a business case for saying, do I really need that back at that level or in that way? So it gives the university an opportunity to have some flexibility to reimagine programs, to realign, to reshape curriculum across the institution, as well as hiring new talent. What it says to the employee taking the program, thank you for a job well done. It's a nice way of celebrating their service. This went over very, very well. It's very popular for the campus when we did it. Any questions about that? Your thoughts? Do you leave the position open in order to yes. absorb that cost? Absolutely. Okay. The position is left open, right, to absorb the cost of the payout. 
So you have to leave it open for a year. And a lot of times we'll backfill if it's a faculty position with an adjunct or a lower level pan position until we figure out what that position is going to be going back in. Any questions about that? Any comments about it? What do you think? You know, I was an adjunct over here for 20 years. It, it, the university still rely heavily on adjuncts because yeah. it's a good buy for the school. Yeah, the, the provost can tell you that on adjuncts. Yes, we do. Yeah. We spend a lot of money on our, on our adjuncts, and I think this is going to help us a lot. We need to have more revenue to kind of move forward on our strategic objectives. This will help provide it. Very quickly, we've got a few APA, Administrative Procedures Act changes. We're changing our parking system. You know, in parking, we have these <laughs> tag decals. That's old technology. Right now, we're going to put in license plate recognition. So all we have to do is look at your license plate, scan it, and they'll say, okay, you pay, and you're legitimate. Right? But that does require an APA change in the law. So you have to do that. You'll see that going forward uh, as well. Here's a good measure of, of, of uh, fiscal health for us, for the campus. You always say, physically, how good is the campus, Richard? What, what do you look like financially? What is your reserve fund? I, if you had your own personal budget, this would be your emergency fund <laughs> for your own personal budget. Here, it's very, very healthy. Uh, the fund balance sets at 4.15% uh, of unallocated uh, ENG uh, expenditures and transfers at $7 million. Uh, very, very healthy. Very healthy here. So if anything, an emergency happens, we have funding to cover that, right? And we've been building that every year, putting something in reserves. Notes and bonds payable, you have to ask the question, do you have enough cash flow to pay off the bonded debt? Are you leveraged at all across the institution? The answer is no. For every capital project we have, there's a dedicated revenue stream to pay that debt. We're, we're, we're very proud of that. So we're not leveraged at all as an institution. Square footage at, in a physical plant, this is a big campus. 3.6 million square feet of space. It's a lot of space. We've added some in 2018. We picked up the old state office building and the map building. A lot of new square footage that we've added on the campus, but we're managing that very, very well. And here's another healthy indicator. Uh, the chancellor just talked about this this morning. Uh, our residence halls are full. Uh, ch Chance will tell a story about what happened. I guess Yancey can tell it when we open the residence halls up for, for occupancy. Go ahead, Yancey. So we, we opened uh, on a Monday morning, and almost five minutes within opening, you see uh, the Walker apartments on South Campus. They were already full within 15 minutes. Three of the buildings were already full. Um, it, it was an amazing, amazing thing. We had 1,600 students trying to get 1,400 spots all within the first hour of opening the, the uh, residence halls for this upcoming fall 20 term. We are a place that is desired. That's what I'm telling you. So our, 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 our future looks bright. When we had the, the uh, Tennessee Promise when the, uh, for the free tuition in two-year schools, Everybody was really running scared. Chance, I'd give it out, applaud him for his leadership. We, we had a residence hall project that was planned, and we, we thought about that. He said, we're going to build that. We thought we'd lose enrollment. Well, it's full. It is amazing stuff, and that's the quality of the university. This is a very good indicator of health across the institution. A campus that's building is a campus that's growing. I will tell you, you'll see right now active projects 115 million dollars worth of capital improvement projects that are ongoing right now on this campus. I got a fence everywhere. <laughs> hopefully, we, hopefully at the end of June we'll have some of them down. But we've got them all over the place in terms of, of making sure we're investing funds. That's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? I have a comment. Um, the other faculty board members, so like of the other boards. We've been talking about the budgets that have been presented to us, and by far, um, UTC, apparently we have been of work, given the most detailed documentation for the budget of any of the other schools. Um, and um, specifically Martin and Knoxville, their representative spoke to me and said, um, we need what you guys have. So I thank Richard and his team for um, all the detail that you have given to us and the transparency of the process.
agree. I was going to make the same comment. I really appreciate the information, the availability of the chancellor and you also um, to the board. I think that is transparency. Chancellor, my old friend Scotty Robasco used to say, I'll say, Richard, great work. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, I, I do want to want to pause and thank Chancellor Engel. When he first came here, he talked to me a little bit about how do we make the budget more transparent and more understandable. We've worked at this, so it's been a team effort from all the vice chancellors with his leadership sitting down at the table working with Tyler and our team. And we do it as a team. And, and that really matters. And at the end of the day, it's all done to serve students. And we keep students as our main focus in everything we do. Thank you. I have, I've seen Richard in action for quite some time at the UC Foundation. <coughs> Transparency has uh, always been a hallmark of, of your operation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Richard Miley comment as I noticed one thing we didn't talk about in here a lot was the timeline and the process actually started before we existed. So, yes. uh, you know, early, you know, in the next year we probably should get, I guess, a little bit more can you lay your heads up on, on where we're going into the next budget cycle, but uh, right. yeah, hopefully we've played catch up. You've done a fabulous job of catching us up because uh, it is a, a well, monster of a project. We'll work with the chance of having to look at the schedule and keep you informed early on. We, we love that you're here as a set of eyes and ears for us and, and really recommend us some things that make us get better. Yeah, we're getting a late start on it, but you've done a great job helping us out. Well, when you look at the document you have to approve, which um, <laughs> versus the other information you had, yeah. um, these Rick. comments of having the information out, I mean, Richard and his team have done a great job, yeah. Yeah. and it is a real team effort. Mm -hmm. I echo that. When you go before the board in June, will an opportunity to give, give this same kind of presentation? And it's all um, by that's been through the. Uh, Finance committee before then, and I think it's on the consent agenda at the board meeting, probably. We presented also to the system CFO and the president. They got an audience with us too. Yeah, that was yesterday. That was yesterday. <laughs> so, yeah. Sounds great. So, this is what we'll recommend you all have. I need a motion to approve the fiscal year 2019-2020 advisory board operating budget. So moved. And, and more. Is it, well, um, do we have a second? Second. I'll keep saying you do. We've got a lot of discussion. <laughs> yes, my friend Phil Corker, Bob's father, what says the mayor? Everything that has been said has been said, but not everybody said it yet. <laughs> but if there is there any more discussion? Not hearing any. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephanie Rowland, who is a coordinate, Title IX coordinator. <coughs> and. Uh, Stephanie, it is yours, please. Thank you so much. So as Mr. DeCosimo said, my name is Stephanie Rowland. I'm UTC's Title IX coordinator, and I oversee all Title IX compliance on our campus. Like Dr. Brown alluded to earlier, I do oversee all gender equity issues in athletics. But what I'm going to focus on today is the other part of my job, and that is overseeing the university's administrative response to sexual misconduct, relationship violence, and stalking. Title IX is a federal law that prohibits discrimination based on sex and education programs and activities that accept federal funds. You will see there that there is no mention of sexual assault, sexual harassment, dating violence, or stalking, but we'll talk about it in just a second. So in 1972, Title IX was signed into law. In a 1980 case that was decided by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, Alexander versus Yale, sexual harassment was decided as part of the as part of sex discrimination. So that was the first time that we saw that. In 1980, the Department of Education was established, as was the Office of Civil Rights. The Office of Civil Rights, or the OCR as we call it, is in charge of Title IX compliance in the United States. In 2001, 
the revised guidance was issued. And that is actually the guidance that we are working off of today, in addition to the 2017 questions and answers. That did include a lot of information about student versus student cases, how universities are required to respond, what we are required to have in terms of infrastructure, in terms of grievance procedures, et cetera. In 2011, there was a sea change in Title IX with what's called the Dear Colleague Letter that was issued by the Obama administration by the Office of Civil Rights. Uh, it was not a notice and comment um, type of document like was in 2001 that was issued to all university presidents and chancellors who then passed it on to their Title IX coordinators. The 2011 document did a lot of different things. So it changed the standard of evidence or said the standard of evidence that we were required to use was preponderance of the evidence. It provided more opportunities for um, complainants, and when I say complainant, I am talking about someone who has accused another person of committing violence against them. It gave them more opportunities for interim measures, things like emergency housing, uh, changing classes, et cetera. In 2013, there was the VAWA reauthorization, the Campus Safe Act that made changes to the Cleary Act. A lot of what we saw in the 2011 document was made into actual law rather than guidance through the Campus Safe Act. So things like required training. So here at UTC, we do require training for all incoming employees on sexual misconduct, relationship violence, and stalking. We also do ongoing training for all employees. That is required under the law. As it, it's also required for incoming freshmen, all transfer students, all graduate students. And we do comply with that as well. In 2014, we received a question and answer, which gave us more questions than answers, I'll say. In 2017, the Trump administration rescinded all of the Dear Colleague letters that were issued under the uh, Obama administration, with the exception of one, and that was the guidance for Title IX coordinators that was issued in 2015. In 2018, we got our big proposed rule. So what the, what the Department of Education did there is they issued proposed rules and gave 60 days for people to make public comment. So the normal number of comments that somebody would, re or that a, the department would receive on a new law, for example, the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization, would be about 20,000. In this case, for the proposed rules, the department received 105,000 comments. So you can see there was a lot of uproar regarding the changes that were recommended. Some of the things include changing the standard of evidence or allowing universities to use a higher standard of evidence. Um, things like notification requirements, investigation requirements, and a lot of different things that would change as a result of the proposed rule. So that's nationally. Here at UTC, our commitment is based on these five factors. So the first is our policy, which is available online. It provides definitions for prohibited conduct. It provides all of our policies and procedures, what we follow when we investigate misconduct. Our prevention education, which includes all of our online education, all of our in-person education, things like mandatory reporter training. I do about 70 or 80 of those a year. Support and interim measures, this is a big deal. So the goal of Title IX is to ensure that students can stay in school during the pendency of an investigation. That's both sides. So we do offer support and interim measures to both parties in each individual case. Investigation and resolution is extremely important as well. In student versus student cases, that's done in the Office of the Dean of Students. In employee cases, that is through the Office of Equity and Inclusion. Last but not least, patterns and trends. This is a big deal in Title IX. So what I do when I'm looking for patterns and trends, I will look at individual locations of incidents, I will look at how the students are affiliated, and see if there are any targeted interventions or targeted educational efforts that need to be made, or if there needs to be a more holistic investigation there. So here's our Title IX team, so I oversee it. We do have a Deputy Title IX Coordinator for Students, who is our Dean of Students, a Deputy Title IX Coordinator for Employees, who is the Director of the Office of Equity and Inclusion, and the Deputy Title IX Coordinator for Athletics, and they each oversee their, their individual parts, 
The Deputy Title IX Coordinator for Athletics is considered to be our expert on campus in gender equity. Okay, so one of our main committees that oversees our, our um, response is our, what we call our SMURGS response team. It stands for Sexual Misconduct, Relationship Violence, and Stalking Response Team. And it was designed because we saw these responses very siloed. So when I came here, one person was doing one thing, one person was doing another thing. Everyone was trying to assist the student, but nobody knew what the other person was doing. So the goal of this team is to have everyone together, to have a conversation about each individual case, each individual student, ensure that the cases are moving forward in a timely manner, ensure that all parties are supported, and to make sure that everything is working as it should. We meet about three times per month, and these are the members. So you can see they do come from a variety of different areas. We have someone from OEI, we have several people from the Office of the Dean of Students, I am the chair of the committee, somebody is there from UTCPD, etc. Okay, so we're gonna look, you all received the annual report in your packet. That's what it looks like. Okay. So I just want to show you some highlights. We do have a lot of information in here about the prevention efforts that we've done on campus. We also have campus climate survey highlights, which talks about the improvements we've seen in our education efforts for our survey. And the last thing that I want to talk about is reports of sexual misconduct, relationship violence, and stalking. Okay, so these are the reports that we've seen in the last five years. And you will see that there is a rapid increase in how many reports we received. How many of you find that scary? Right, okay. I would find that scary too, except that I know about national prevalence, and I know what these numbers look like nationally. And what we know is that one in five women and one in 16 men will be the victim of sexual assault during the time they are in college. That is a national stat. Um, sure. So 20% of students are assaulted on yes. campus. That, during the time they are in college. So it might happen off campus, it could happen between students, it could be, happen between students and non-students, yes. And also our education advisory board survey does indicate that 20% of our students reported being the victim of sexual violence before they even get here. So, and that, that is kind of with national stats. Okay. okay, sorry. All right, so you can see a large increase here. So the numbers don't particularly scare me when I think about it in terms of the percentages of what's actually occurring on our campus. This actually, I see it as a positive. It's very weird to say, but stick with me. Because we do want these numbers to be zero. We want zero incidents to happen on our campus, period. But what we know is they are occurring, and these numbers are going up, indicating that students feel comfortable reporting, they know where to report, they feel safe going through the process, and that mandatory reporters or faculty and staff know that they have to report these types of incidents when students report to them. Does anyone have any questions? Any more questions about this? Reports by type. You can see that we did have very little, we had a big increase in relationship violence from last year over this year. I think it was about a 40% increase. And you can tie that to specific things that we've done on campus. So, so specific posters about reporting, specific flyers about dating violence. There's almost an immediate increase in things that are reported. When students realize that they can get help for domestic violence that occurred before they got here, and that they can get help for things that occur off campus. This is our sexual misconduct, relationship violence, and stalking prevention website. This has information on how students can get help, how you can help someone who's been impacted by sexual violence, how to report, etc. Does anyone have any questions for me? Most of these, most of these complaints are, are, are allegations made 
by some student against another student or faculty staff member or some of them for events that occurred with people unrelated to the campus? I would say it's about half and half. So if we're talking about on, so let's separate those out. So we'll talk about on campus versus off campus events. Most of the incidents that are reported do occur off campus. I'm not talking just off campus, with, with, with people who are not related to the university. So that information is in the um, annual report. And you'll see that most incidents do involve student versus student or another community member, but it's pretty close. So the increased reporting, because you know, uh, um, in my world also, we heavily, you know, encourage people to report. Right. How do you think you've achieved that comfort level in additional reporting from students? I will say that students know who I am. They see me from the very beginning. I'm there at orientation. I'm doing all sorts of programming. I think students understand um, when they see flyers all over our campus, literally in every bathroom stall, they understand where they can go and how they can be supported. I think another thing that helps us is our survivor advocacy services. So the fact that we have confidential resources on our campus who can help students navigate um, the process, so help navigate the, the university and also the criminal process, I think that helps with reporting as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, do we have any other business? Can we just get a read on the uh, voluntary retirement incentive program? Does anybody have heartburn on that? Because I does that is that encouraging not necessarily your best, but an awful lot of experienced teachers who might be quite talented to to well, leave. My only concern I'm looking at it from as a devil's advocate. There's some who could say this is another way of age discrimination. Let's get rid of the old folks that are making more money and bringing the new people that don't cost much. Well, and it, it is voluntary, yeah. and you have to have 20 years of service. Yeah. Um, we didn't do it where somebody with five years who's older could retire. Um, we looked at the implications of that, but it didn't seem fair. Um, you know, in the School of Education, we were hiring a new director the last time we did this five years ago. We had six retirements, and the new director came in and was able to hire six new people, sorry, which was um, a real opportunity. Um, it allowed us to reorganize in some other areas. There are a few places we lost people that were uh, valuable, and we worked around it. Um, but we are trying to look at succession planning, training people to be able to assume some of these roles. So, um, you know, we're hoping we can manage costs and reallocate resources to areas where a number will become available. From a faculty perspective, and George could probably second me on this, um, the board has put in a new policy last year. Um, it's a post-tenure review. And we have people who are in departments who haven't had a comprehensive review for almost 20 years. So they got promoted to full professor and no one's overly reviewed them except for their annual review, um, which is a, it's just not as detailed of a process. Um, and so um, we anticipate a little bit that some of those people who would prefer not to go through that review will choose this option. Because if they indicate, if it's approved by the board in June and they indicate that they, that they would like to participate in that, they're basically opting out of that review process. Well, that's the other way to look at it. It, is, it serves as an incentive to get rid of people who are not productive. Well, I think it, it, it's a change. Or, or it's, I, what I want to say is a shift at the university. So people who were hired 30 years ago, their main focus was teaching and that was it. Yeah. So since I was hired, which has been 17 years, when I was hired, a, like half of my focus of hiring was what research are you going to do? Here's some startup money. 
who you get involved in research, that kind of thing. So we have people on campus who that was never part of their hiring directive. And um, so if we're trying to shift, which we are trying to have more experiential learning, um, more research experiences, increase our graduate enrollment, um, all of that, we need more research focused faculty. And so this is an opportunity for those faculty to maybe consider do they want to make this shift, this big change yeah. in what they've been doing for 30 some years, or perhaps um, maybe they would like to go spend and enjoy their retirement. So what if you don't else. get the anticipated uh, participation? What happens then? Not nothing. The end okay. of the day. It's, it, there are no targets at all. In fact, we've worked this program through our legal team to make sure that no discrimination takes place. It's totally voluntary. In fact, even if you inquire about the program, it's confidential. No one will know that you even stepped up and said, I, I, I want to consider that. Our, our, our experience from folks who took it last time, they were so thankful. Generally, you find people who, who take this, they're thinking about retirement anyway, and that this incentive provides them a lump sum of cash that they can pay off their debts. In, in fact, I, I, you know, of course my sexual harassment person, I told them, you can't hug me. <laughs> <laughs> you can't hug me for it. Employees love this, those who took advantage of it. You really did like it at the end of the day. Yeah. The Vice day. President got in a lot of trouble by saying that, That's Richard. True. <laughs> 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 the vice. I mean, it's hard to think of an enterprise as large as this university that doesn't Don't have this that. type of program or hasn't had it or considered it or used it at some time. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think it's a helpful tool. And, you know, it breaks up some of the staleness. It, it's a needed introspective to see, you know, what are we doing and who's doing it and how do we go about it? Yeah, on the other end of the extreme, I can tell you, I've, uh, you know, over the years advised a number of individual clients who, as Richard said, came to me, it's like, hey, they've got this program, you know, I'm tickled pink. You know, what am I missing? And, you know, you'll lose some people you don't want to lose. Um, and and that, that's going to happen. And then, you know, there'll be others that just say, yeah, I'll take your money. Bye. So, I, I mean, I think it's a good program. Rich, you must have an idea if you've got it in your budget. Yeah. It, is that with uh, some knowledge you have about <laughs> others? Just, just prior practice at the end of the prior okay. knowledge of the numbers of, of people who took advantage of it. It's more that we could make available. I mean, they're probably 250. But we think, based on the profiles we saw before, about 130 some okay. people will yeah. take a look at this. Now, it, it allows you the opportunity to rethink or reimagine a division uh, when two or three people take advantage of this. You don't have to put put it back the same way. You can realign, you know, and, 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 and reimagine a division at the end of the day. And again, it's totally voluntary. Totally voluntary. Richard, thank you. And our next meeting will be October the 3rd. Um, Terry will let us know where and when. And I'd like to recognize our chancellor for closing remarks. Well, thank you. Um, appreciate everybody's time and uh, engagement. And uh, also want to echo again um, so JJ, why don't you just tell us, this is a nice way to wrap up since we're about students and success. Yes. You have several job offers. Yes. Are you going to stay around Chattanooga, uh, off to Nashville? I'm trying to decide right now. Um, I got offered a position at UBS as a client outreach specialist with mm -hmm. clients for banks and stuff like that. Um, got offered a position here with US Express as a financial analyst. And I also mm -hmm. got, um, I got an offer from Snyder Electric and their finance rotational program. So I will move three places in three years. So. Pretty, pretty good options is all I'm trying to say right now. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's Congrats. great. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Too much time. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we're dismissed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.